here to be able to join us for this uh, College of Natural Resources seminar series. Um, the theme to the fifth seminar series, this, this, this session, is the changing climate of natural resources management. And if you couldn't tell, that's kind of a hidden term. This is about climate change, <laughs> obviously. Many of you who were able to join us last Thursday, uh, Ben Zuckerberg talked about climate change and the impacts on wildlife. And I'll let Jennifer introduce our next speaker, um, who will be talking more about some of the impacts on forestry. Um, hopefully we have room. Everybody can get settled in. Come on in. <laughs> I, I'm Scott Hingstrom with the uh, Wisconsin Center for Wildlife. I'm a, the director of that center. Um, our office is located right through that wall. Just when he was able to move in about a month ago, and we don't even have pictures on the walls yet, but we're getting there. Uh, pretty soon it'll look pretty habitable. Uh, but uh, we're happy to entertain anyone from the public coming in, talking with us about various natural resources issues, wildlife issues. Um, I think uh, it's appropriate here to recognize the sponsors of this uh, seminar series. So we have them up here. I don't have to read them all off for you. <laughs> But there are three endowments that support the seminar series, as well as the College of Natural Resources and then University of Wisconsin Extension. Next slide, please. And since it's a public meeting like this, um, there's an, or, uh, an arrangement with the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point to recognize the Ho-Chunk Nation and the Menominee Nation for um, their ex their, uh, the lands that they own here, of which the university sits upon, um, the remembrance of those people, the sacred nature of the land, that we have here and the people from their past. So just a moment of recognition of the people in the sacred land that we have here from these indigenous people. Jennifer, are you ready to introduce our, our speaker? I am. So first of all, again, I would like to just echo what Scott said. I'd like to thank everybody here for coming. It's really great to see all these faces from the community and to see all students here. So thank you so much for coming. Um, so today, um, continuing our series, we have Linda Parker, and she is going to be speaking today about her experience on the Shawamagan Nicolay National Forest. She's a forest ecologist with uh, the Shawamagan Nicolay National Forest, and she has been since 1991. She's a native of Virginia. She holds a Master's of Science degree in Zoology, with an emphasis in ecology, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Wisconsin-Green Bay. She has served as the forest climate forest climate change coordinator since 2008. In addition to forest ecology, Linda is also responsible for managing botany, invasive species, or non-native invasive species, and natural areas programs on the Shawamagan National Nicolay National Forest. She is also a member of an incident management team and has had numerous wildland fire assignments throughout the United States. So I'd like to take this moment to say thank you again to Linda for joining us, and please welcome Linda Parker. Jennifer, can you get the lights? Yeah. Do you usually put some the lights on? Okay, I'm, I'm wired. I got two pockets full of microphones here, so. Great. Well, great. This is a, this is a great turnout. Thanks so much for your interest in this topic. Um, quick question, how many of you guys have been to the Schwamagan Nicolay National Forest? Awesome, that's great, that's great. So um, just a, a quick kind of flyby for those who haven't been or those of you that wish you were there or wish it looked like this right now. Um, and uh, so we are, if you look at the, the dark green area on the map, that's the Schwamigan Nicolay National Forest. This is a map of public, land, public lands. You can see there's a lot of public lands up north. Um, but the green on the east side is the Nicolay, uh, what we, used to be just the Nicolay National Forest. Uh, to the west is the old Shawamigan National Forest we combined in the mid-1990s. And we're a million and a half acres, so from Bayfield County all the way over to Oconto County. So lots to keep me busy. Um, this time of year, we're usually on the ski trails or snowshoe trails. This is the wintergreen area in Price County. And uh, in the summer, if you're, you like to fish, this is a, you know, there's lots of opportunities for fishing. Um, we spend a lot of time in, the, in boats paddling our kayaks. Um, this is St. Peter's Dome. Anybody been to St. Peter's Dome? Great views. You can see Lake Superior from up here. So um, um, nice little North Country Trail takes you right to it. The longest waterfall in the state is Morgan Falls. That's nearby St. Peter's Dome. And we have lots and lots of cool boggy lakes to explore, a covered bridge in Price County where all the kids go for their prom pictures. 
And um, I love tromping around in these bogs. I love botanizing in the bogs, things like pitcher plant. If you're a bow hunter, plenty of things, places for you to, ex to explore. Lots and lots of cool little critters. The Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center is in Ashland. It's a really a, a great hub of activity. Um, we have over 250 natural areas on the forest, um, about 180,000 acres. A hundred of those are co-designated as state natural areas. We're also in the highest a band that's the highest diversity of breeding birds in North America. So if you look at the red zone across northern Wisconsin, uh, you can see that northern Minnesota, northern Wisconsin, and northern Michigan, the highest diversity of breeding birds in North America which is awesome if you like birds, and I love birds, so I'm going to show you some pictures of birds. Um, so we, we've been, we did this bird monitoring on the Schwamigan and Nicolay. We did it for 30 years, and we combined our data with the Chippewa and Superior National Forest in Minnesota. So we had 400,000 birds that we counted as part of that effort, and 30,000 individual point counts. Anybody know what this one is? I know Dorothy does, because she draws them. Anyone guess? Black Bernian warbler. Black warbler, yeah, fire throat. Isn't it beautiful? Um, this is the most common bird counted on our survey. Any guesses? Should I just shout it out? Uh, oven bird, yeah, oven bird with a little orange hat. The, that was the most common bird on the Schwamigan Nicolay. Um, how about the second most common bird? Red-eyed vireo, I heard somebody say. Yeah, you can see his red eye there. They're the marathon singers, right? They sing all day. Here I am, where are you? Over here in the tree, look at me. Um, the third most common bird, a little tougher now. You're not, you're not confident enough to shout it. It's a Nashville warbler. Third most common bird on the Schwamigan Nicolay. And this is, an, this is a super common bird, really common, right? Everybody knows this one. Sings, hint, hint. Song sparrow, yep. Yeah. It's a little spot on its chest. Everybody knows this one, right? We have affiliated woodpecker, yep. Yeah. And this cute little guy. I love when their, their names are basically like, look, like you're looking at them. Chestnut-sided warbler, yep, yeah, exactly. And how about this one? The first warbler to show up in the spring. Yellow rump, yeah, or, or butterbutt. It's in those. Myrtle warbler, it's got a lot of names. And this guy, not very common, but one of my favorites. It is a, anybody know this one? This is, a, this is the expert level here. Kate May. Kate May, okay, awesome, yeah, Kate May warbler. Isn't that cool? And in case you think that we, all we do is count birds and protect natural areas, we also harvest a lot of timber. We are the produce, uh, harvest more timber than any national forest in the country, and that's been the case for uh, a number of years. Last year, 128 million board feet. And we are the home of the climate change response framework, which is probably why you're here. Um, so about 10 years ago, I started collaborating with some researchers from our northern research station in Houghton, Michigan. And uh, so we started working on a project, and our regional forester in Milwaukee at that time, excuse me, said, said um, you know, this is pretty cool. Why don't you guys, you know, work on climate change, and you can be a living laboratory for climate change on the Schwamigan Nicolet, and you guys can figure this whole climate change thing out, right? So in other words, you guys go first and figure out what we should do about climate change. And you can be the, a model forest, which was you know, pretty daunting, but also really, really exciting that we could sort of take some time and take, and we had support, and we were able to take the initiative to try to figure it out. So now the climate change response framework is leading climate readiness across uh, 19 states, 14 national forests, millions of acres. So it's being, this, what I'll talk about today, is being used um, all across, the, particularly the eastern United States. Essentially, 
it's the, our idea was to take all this, all this data, all these projections, all these models, and try to identify what are the impacts on ecosystems. And then develop some real world responses. Pretty simple, right? Um, our, you know, one of our primary goals is to put climate adaptation into practice. So what I'll talk about here today is uh, talk about some of what we found. And um, I'll also talk about a demonstration project that kind of um, shows you what it looks like on the ground. And it's the Marengo and 20 Mile Creek watershed. It was our attempt to make a uh, watershed more resilient and to prepare for extreme precipitation events. So we start today with a couple questions. One is, what is most vulnerable to climate change? Of course, I'm talking mostly about the northern forest here today, because that's my backyard, literally. And then what are some of the changes that we're already seeing? So one of the first things we did out of the, out of the shoot when we became the, the model forest is um, a vulnerability assessment. So this is our uh, attempt to sort of catalog what are the key ecosystem vulnerabilities um, based on a range of different climate scenarios, right? Because we don't exactly know future climate, right? So we can, but we can model, we can use models that are based on different climate scenarios, and we could project how ecosystems would respond under, those, under that range of future scenarios. And our primary focus is on, on forest ecosystems in this effort although we've branched out. Um, we're also, we are so also work very closely with the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. We are part of Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts. I'm on the forestry working group. I worked to help to write the first initial assessment on climate change. I think Ben Zuckerberg probably talked about this last week quite a bit. Um, Dan Vimont is our um, co-chair of WIKI. And he's a climate um, professor of atmospheric sciences at UW-Madison. Hopefully, if this works, there's a short little video that Dan narrated that, um, come on, come on, that summarizes some of the, I'm just going to relax here for a second and wait for this video <laughs> to because it worked great on my computer. And we're definitely connected to the internet, right? OK. I'm not seeing an arrow. Oops, shoot. There is. Um, like here? Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, that, that's an advance. Mm, yeah, it's not showing it like it's a video. Shoot. Okay. Well, plan B. Maybe we can show it. So I prepared for this. So I have a couple dry, very dry slides compared to Dan's uh, nice little video. But basically just summarizing that they did quite a bit of work at the Center for Atmospheric for Climatic Research to summarize changes that have been observed. And um, uh, you know, basically, we're seeing changes, more changes likely, and, and changes that are not likely, but changes that we've observed in the winter compared with summer. We have observed changes in uh, precipitation as well as temperature. We have observed changes in the growing season, and certainly the cold uh, hardiness for many plant species has changed. Six to eight days a growing season advanced that we have experienced already. We have observed an increase in large precipitation events. And large events greater than three inches are definitely more frequent. That's, that's something we've measured. And if you live in Wisconsin, <laughs> you've experienced this too. <laughs> Uh, you don't need the climate scientists to tell you that we've experienced more extreme precipitation events. And it's affected all of us in a very personal way. Another thing that we've noticed is that boreal, boreal birds, meaning those birds associated with the 
the black spruce and tamarack and balsam fir, that they're declining, um, like this boiled chickadee. Um, here's some, uh, 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 some data from the Nicolet bird survey. Gray jays are now called Canada jays, same thing. Um, my favorite bird. I mean, I just, I love gray jays, uh, Canada jays. I do a Christmas bird count in Price County every year, and I go to the same bog every year, and boy, they used to find me. Like, here, I, hey, Linda's here. Hey, she's back, you know. And I, it's been uh, maybe five years since I've seen, seen a Canada jay. But here's just, these are some of the points on the Nicolet, where, again, over 30 years, where we observed Canada jays and um, the number of points that, were, that showed an increase in Canada jays versus the number of points where we saw a decrease in Canada jays. So definitely, definitely a declining species. And this is um, consistent with, did any of you guys participate in the Wisconsin bird atlas over the last five years or so or in the past? Um, I'm going to zoom in here. And so these are the, the 10 species that showed a decline, the, the biggest decline in this most recent bird atlas versus the one that was done 20 years ago. Um, this is, again, all over the state, not just the Nicolet. And of the top 10 um, species that showed a decline, six are boreal birds. And um, two are kind of erratics, like white wing crossbills and uh, evening grosbeaks, meaning you know they're, sometimes they're here in the winter and sometimes they're not. But, but boreal chickadee, Canada jay, black backed woodpecker, a uh, Connecticut warbler, definitely um, species that we're, we're seeing um, on the decline. OK, good. I was afraid I was going to wreck it. So now you want to know, of course, what do we expect in the future? And I will gaze into my crystal ball, and I will tell you exactly, nope, that's, <laughs> don't have a crystal ball. But what we do have are models and projections, and lots of really, really smart climate scientists um, working with us to, um, to project changes in temperature um, into the future. And then, so we take that climatic data and again, try to determine how it will affect the Northwoods. Bonus points for anybody that knows where this picture was taken. Hint, you may have been to a concert there. Mm -hmm. Mount Ashwa Bay, Big Top Chautauqua, but overlooking Lake Superior. So what are some of the, just, and this is just a thumbnail sketch, right? So I could talk a very long time about this. Um, what are some of the impacts that we expect on forests? Well, if it's going to be warmer, um, that's going to have a f an effect on soil moisture. And um, we expect to have less frozen ground in the winter, and that has an effect on logging. On, if you're, a, if you're a, a logger in the winter, you really need frozen ground. And we would expect an increase in fire risk. There's more trees down, more mortality, more dying trees, more stress trees. We would expect an increase in fire risk. And we expect an increase in extreme weather events. And speaking of that, <laughs> we saw a pretty, big, pretty extreme weather event in northern Wisconsin this year where we had multiple derechos go across the state. Anybody would, was out and about on July um, 19th through 21st, uh, we had a lot of wind, right? And then so this event on the northeastern Wisconsin hit the Nicolet National Forest, hit Okano County, Langley County, 250,000 acres are damaged. And um, of that, about half of that is on the Nicolet side of the forest, and it amounts to 10% of our total national forest that was affected, that was damaged by, wind, by this wind event last year. Pretty significant. And so, just in general, we expect that climate change could make forests more susceptible to all kinds of stressors, right? It could be bugs, uh, insects, pests, pathogens. It could be things that aren't here yet. Um, but we might see new stressors, like maybe hemlock woolly adelgid. 
that's not here in Wisconsin uh, yet, but it could be. Um, it seems to be limited by cold temperatures. Uh, or something like um, Japanese barberry or other invasive plants, they love disturbance, right? They will love tree mortality. They will be more than happy to have more sunlight on the forest floor, right? They will take full advantage of stressed forests. Um, we work with a team of researchers um, on the Climate Atlas project, and they have been looking at how the a range, tree species, the, the range of tree species may change in the future. Now this isn't like trees just all of a sudden say, let's get out of here, let's, you know, it's too damn warm here, let's, get, let's go north. This is about the habitat, what will happen to the habitat suitability of these tree species. And um, so what you see here on the left, and the, the color is basically what we call importance value. And that's a combination of how many trees, the frequency and how big they are, the basal area. So we can map, so on the left is our current importance value for sugar maple. And you can see that it's mostly up north. It's, it reaches you know, kind of the heart of its range up north. Um, and, but you can see on the right side, the upper right, how that habitat for sugar maple may change under a lower emission scenario and also compare it with a higher emission, CO2 emission scenario, which is essentially the path that we're on right now. And so you can see that much less suitable habitat for sugar maple in the future under this higher emission scenario. So we would need to know that as foresters, as forest planners, as land managers. We need to, to have an eye to the future because when we make a forest plan, it's for you know, the next 50 years. Um, I would say you know, a farmer gets to decide every year what kind, kind of crops to plant, but a forester only gets that chance you know, once every 40, 50, maybe 100 years. Here's quaking aspen, a very similar story. The heart of its range, the, ha the most suitable habitat is in the north. And you can see under the higher emission scenario, much less habitat that would be suitable. So these are species, you can see that they, they pretty much are at the southern edge of their range in Wisconsin. And guess what? We have a lot of species <laughs> in Wisconsin that are at the southern edge of their range. Most of our dominant tree species are as about as far south as they are going to go, you know, at least in terms of their of being dominant tree species. So you'll find them, but they're dominant here. Uh, there's a lot of data on this, and I, there's a handout at this forestadaptation.org website. I should have mentioned that earlier. That's kind of one, that, the wiki website, W-I-C-C-I, and this forestadaptation.org, really two very powerful websites in terms of getting information, getting um, access to um, presentations, videos, and handouts like this. And so just a summary, these are some of the species that are um, likely to decline in habitat. Again, um, there, are mo there are a lot of our dominant tree species right now, black spruce, balsam fir, white cedar, yellow birch, paper birch, white spruce, black ash, and quaking aspen. And these are some of our, you know, beautiful, iconic species of the Northwoods. Ba paper birch here, black spruce, bogs, and quaking aspen, that beautiful, you know, white, white bark and against the blue northern summer skies or fall skies, just, um, you know, what we associate with northern Wisconsin. Balsam fir, Christmas trees, balsam bells, you know, it's, so it's, a, it's part of our culture as well as our, our natural heritage. These are some species that may decline based on our, the model projections from the climate change tree atlas. Notice the trend, jack pine, red pine, white pine, sugar maple, tamarack. Um, the only one that no change is projected as right now is northern red oak, interestingly. There are a few that are projected to increase. And again, notice the trend here. These are very southern species. <laughs> Bitternut hickory, black oak, northern pin oak, white oak, Bur oak, 
Um, and a couple of them are, like White Ash and American Beech, have some serious disease issues. So while their habitat suitability may increase, that increase is likely to be offset by diseases like amber lash borer. So here's just an example of a species that could increase the suitability, the suitability of its habitat. Here's white oak. You can see it's not very common in northern Wisconsin at all, but potentially it might have better, more suitable habitat in the future. Now it's got to get there, you know. Um, just it's not going to be a magic. It's got to get there, and it's got to regenerate, and it's got to get past the deer and lots of other issues, right? So it's not would not be an, an easy like mm, we'll just have you know oak instead. So transition, and that's that's what we do. So I would say favor the pines, favor the oaks. <laughs> Whenever in doubt, favor the oaks. If you have oaks in your in your stand, favor the oaks. So then, okay, so we know a lot of stuff. We've learned a lot, and we've tried to capture it. We've tried to summarize it. Now, what do we do about it? How do we start to adapt? So adaptation, you know, is basically taking action to prepare for climate change. I feel good about that. I always feel better when I'm taking some action. Um, a lot of these adaptation activities, they're not... It's not like a brand new, here's your new toolbox for climate change. It's not. It's really a lot of the very same tools and techniques for sustainable management, for restoration, conservation that we're using now. So that's great. We, we came up with this uh, document we call Forest Adaptation Resources, or FAR. Um, it's kind of a menu. It's, you know, we want to make things really easy for land managers or even landowners to say, what should I do? Well, here's a menu of adaptation ideas in this document and a workbook to help you think about it. So, you know, we all, if, we ask, if I ask everyone in here, what do you value about force? It's probably going to be lots and lots of different answers. It might be just a place to hang out, to hike with your kids, or a place to hunt, or a place to kayak, or a place for, you know, boards and cords. And so there really is not, I mean, we really can't have kind of a one-size-fits-all. You want to adapt to climate change? Do this. Um, it really has to start with the first box, which is what's your management objectives? What are you, what are you interested in? What do you care about? What do you want to see um, managed um, for? What do, what do you want us to emphasize? And then we look at that, those objectives, we look at that site and we look at that place. What's unique about that? Maybe it's the north side, maybe it's a north slope so it stays cooler. Maybe it's in a snow belt so it gets more snow. So all these site specific characteristics really have to come into play. And then we evaluate, figure out, well, how do we think climate change will affect that place and affect those objectives? Can you still meet your objectives? And then the best part is number four, where we identify some adaptation approaches, some adaptation strategies that we can put in place. All right, so enough with the flow charts and you know, all that stuff, right? Um, what do we actually do that's different on the ground? So let me talk about that. So this is our case study for the Marengo and 20 Mile Creek watersheds. Um, again, to try to prepare them for extreme precipitation events. So, backing up to 2012, does anybody remember this 2012 storm that went through Duluth? Do you remember the zoo got flooded? Um, and here's a picture of Feisty the harbor seal, like looking very afraid. <laughs> you know? so this is the poster child for climate change here, this poor Feisty, because the zoo got flooded, they had 10 inches of rain, it was a pretty, very, very serious flood, um, serious storm that led to flooding in Duluth. So not in my back, I mean, it's kind of near my backyard, but it's not in my backyard, but my, our hydrologist at the time, Dale Higgins, um, so uh, such an amazing hydrologist, we, we were looking at this, reading about it, going, you know, that could totally happen here, couldn't it? I'm like, yeah, it really could. 
and the projections seem to be that we would start to see more of these kinds of um, events. So we got together and we said, let's apply the, these adaptation ideas to a watershed. Um, and the, so it's these two, two, the brown and the green watershed, they're the headwaters of Lake Superior. They're in the Pinocchio Range. This is um, Mellon. Let's see if I can get this to work. Whoa, without blinding someone. I can't. Um, Ashland is the, up there in that in the in Schwamigan Bay, so it's about mm, it's about 30, 40 miles uh, south of Ashland. Again, headwaters of Lake Superior, cold water, which means trout, right? <laughs> yeah, trout. And so lots of lots of folks love these areas because of their trout. Um, so we got a team together. We had fish biologists, we got foresters, we got a hydrologist, uh, and me, ecologists, and we got together and we said, let's figure out what we can do to prepare this uh, watershed for a flood or storm like Duluth had just had. And we started looking at the data and saying, wow, you know, NOAA in 2000, in the early 2000s, NOAA had already had updated their precipitation estimates for our region for the Great Lakes region. And they said that um, Ashland was a hot spot, a rainfall hot spot, and that the proje projections for precipitation were 37% more than previously thought. And um, so that meant that all of our bridges and roads and culverts were all built based on you know, outdated data. So we, we came up with our list of what was vulnerable to climate change in these two watersheds. Obviously, if you increase the water temperature, you lose trout. That trout just have to have cold water. And um, so we knew that that was a risk. And we knew that if we had more intense storms like they just had in Duluth, uh, we could get lots more runoff and sedimentation, which is also not good for trout. Like clean, clean, clear water, cold water. If we had more floods, that would obviously damage our infrastructure. If we started to see tree species decline, like I talked about, um, we, we might have mortality along the streams, which means less shade, which means more sun, which means warm, uh, warmer streams. And then if we have more wind throw, um, again, that leads to younger forests, um, which is great in some places, but if you have younger forest near a stream, you're going to have probably beaver. And if you have beaver, you have beaver dams. And if you have beaver dams, you have warm water. So these are some of the vulnerabilities that we identified. So what did we decide to do? Well, we knew we needed to right size our their culverts. And we have a lot of roads on the National Forest, and we have a lot of streams. And so we have a lot of road stream crossings. And so we needed to. Um, match the culverts to um, these new precipitation estimates. We needed to diversify our forest. I mean, uh, when all this feels, diversify, diversify, right? Because if you don't know exactly what's going to happen um, to a tree species in the future, absolutely have as many tree species as you can, right? Have diversity in your system. And so we want, especially wanted our riparian, which is means along the rivers, along the streams. We wanted those to be more diverse. And we wanted to underplant, make sure there was conifer, because conifer keeps things cool, right? Hemlock, white pine, cedar. Um, and we wanted to promote more long-lived species, like white pine and hemlock, again, to discourage the beaver, and destabilize any of the eroding banks, because that eroding banks make sediment. And sediment is not good for trout. So, man, I tell you, I, I know more about culverts than I ever wanted to know. And <laughs> when I was sitting in the state like this, you know, when I was in school, if somebody said, someday you're going to be giving a presentation about culverts, I would just say, shoot me now. Um, <laughs> here I am talking about culverts. But I, I work with some really smart people, and they know a lot more about this than I do. But what, from what I, they tell me, so this is an idea that we've been trying to impl implement called stream simulation design, which is to basically match the road stream crossing, the culvert, match it to the 
um, to the stream, natural stream processes, right? So the, I, you want the aquatic organisms to be able to like just go up and downstream and not even know that there's a culvert there at all. And you want wood and water and sediment to just pass downstream unobstructed, in theory. And so you can see on the left, here's a picture of a culvert before we did the magic culvert upgrade work, which is really messy and really expensive. <laughs> um, and here it is after the upgrade. So you can see it's, a, it's the stuff's just, water's just able to flow downstream. Happy little aquatic organisms are able to just pass up and down. And then here's another one on a tributary to Whiskey Creek. You can see we're having a lot of road washouts um, if you have these undersized culverts. And here's after the upgrade. So we're feeling pretty good. Feeling pretty good. Like, yep, we got out there ahead of time. And then we put it to the test. <laughs> we designed a test. No. <laughs> um, yeah, so here it came. July 11, 2016. And a whopper of a storm came through this area. And, uh, and it, was anybody up north during this time? Or, yeah. It was kind of a scary time. We had about 9, 10 inches of rain overnight, literally boom. It just dropped overnight and it washed out tons of roads, caused lots and lots of millions of dollars of damage. Many homes were damaged. Um, it was an absolute transportation nightmare. I mean, we had the two major roads that go north and south, Highway 63, Highway 13, boom, they're washed out. They look like this. You're not getting over that. The road that goes across the top from east to west, US 2, boom, that's wiped out. <laughs> right, so it was just almost, I'm on an incident management team and like, okay, be at such and such a place at 9 o'clock and I'm like, um, how do I get there? <laughs> and, you know, damage infrastructure can have deadly consequences. A woman drove off Highway 63, drove past barriers, plunged 50 feet on Highway 63 near Grandview and died. Another gentleman died in his car when his car went into a flooded ditch. His wife was rescued. Another guy near in Iron County um, died because a, a poor Bayfield County Sheriff's deputy had to cling to a tree for two hours when his, his uh, patrol car got washed into the waters of Pearl Creek. Um, so it was a very, very scary time. You can, Saxon Harbor, this is up in the UP, just absolutely uh, underwater. And so uh, the DNR has flow meters on different streams and crazy data. One stream went from 400 cubic feet per second to 7,000 in just minutes, just minutes. And you can see why. You know? Another, the Bad River gauge broke a previous record of 72 years uh, when it went from when it peaked at 40,000 cubic feet per second. Previous peak was 26,000. So it was a big storm. And as I said, people <laughs> were just like trying to get places, right? And this is a sign. Somebody, somebody wrote on the back of a stop sign. This is up in the Pinocchio Range, west of Mellon, because people are just like lost, right? So if you want to go to Ashland, go right to civilization. <laughs> if you go straight, that's chaos. And if you go left, just don't, <laughs> don't even think about it. It was a crazy time. Um, so the heart of the storm, yep, you guessed it, Marengo 20 mile watershed, uh, right, this is like right in the heart of the, right here, see where it says nine inches? That's, that's the, <laughs> that's the, um, that is our backyard. And so, um, and that's bedrock controlled um, soil there, uh, landform, which means the soil is like this thin. It's very, very shallow, very shallow soil. So not a great plate, not really great for absorbing a lot of precipitation overnight. So I, as I said, I'm on this incident management team and I'm talking with a uh, hydrologist, Dale, and I'm right away, I'm, how, how did, everything, how did everything stand up to the storm? Well, 20 out of the 20 of culverts that we put in, 17 survived being overtopped. 
The other three were in very narrow, very entrenched areas that just had, they just had no chance. So th this was like a three times a 500 year flood. Um, but pretty good. We were feeling pretty good about 17. So here's one that was literally overtopped um, by the flood in, on Preemption Creek, and it's, in, it's survived. Um, and so that's great. That saves a lot of money, right? I mean, it, it's, it's great. We don't have to fix those roads. But the really, really key point is that it maintained access for first responders. You can imagine there were a lot of 911 calls during this time, right? It maintained access for first responders. It maintained access for evacuation routes <laughs> so people could get out of the flooded area. Um, uh, provided access to gravel pits. So we needed to get to the gravel pits to fix those roads, right? So that was, that was huge. So we were nominated and we placed, we were received that we were premier runner up, which is a fancy way of saying we got second place <laughs> <laughs> for this prize for progress from the American Adaptation. And we were, we were second to the city of San Francisco. So I, don't, I feel like that's pretty good. That's, you know. The city of San Francisco and the Schwamagin Nicolay National Award. Right. So that was great. We got a plaque. I got a mug. We were feeling pretty good. <laughs> Second place mug. <laughs> and then we got another flood. We got the Father's Day flood two years later. Fortunately, not exactly. I mean, uh, the same general, as you can see, it's the same kind of general area. But it was, you can see the heart of the storm. The, um, we, the original storm was, let's see, I'm not even going to do that. Oops. Um, it, it covered a, a big area. The heart of the storm was not exactly where uh, the Marengo 20 mile watershed, although that certainly was affected. It was really a little bit more to the west in the Drummond, Drummond area. And so, Six to 10 inches, sound familiar, but 15 inches of rain in Drummond area. Um, that is a lot of rain. And state of emergency is declared in a couple counties. Back to the type, or my type three incident management team is back, deployed again. Um, I usually go out on fi wildfires out west, but that summer, these last few summers, I've actually had more, more work to do locally because of floods and blowdowns and whatnot. This is the aerial image of the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center in Ashland. So that's Highway 2 going through there. And um, the, the police actually, sheriff actually posted a slow no wake sign there. <laughs> <laughs> so now these are pictures from my forest, from the Schwam again. Uh, and this is, this is a road. <laughs> it looks like a beach. But it's like a river of sand now. That's how much land mass just kind of moved. Um, just a massive amount of earth moved as a result of that storm. Here's a, here's a culvert was 200 feet away from off the road. Um, just lots and lots of damage to those. So this is not the area that we had worked in. This is a different area, but obviously, um, we should have worked here too, I guess. Um, lots of forest road damage that we're still working on. This is a Rainbow Lakes Wilderness area on the North Country Trail. You could, you could swim the trail, I guess. <laughs> lots of washouts. Um, you can see the sediment flowing into Lake Superior. There's the Bayfield Peninsula, so you can see just the, uh, the, the shoreline is just rimmed with mud and, and sediment. And here's a video of that I can't show. Nope. Darn. It's a really cool video. Maybe we can get, I don't know, maybe we can get out and get it some other way. But, um, but anyway, that, you know, so this is our new reality. And um, these extreme precipitation events, we're going to be dealing with them. And we really have, it you know, makes it abundantly clear that we really have no time to waste. Um, to, to make our watersheds and our forests uh, more resilient, as resilient as possible. And um, Catherine Hayhoe is a climate scientist. I like this quote. She says, the number one thing we can do about climate change is not to change a light bulb, it's to talk about it. So thank you for inviting me here to talk about it with you all.
Thank you. So, any, we do have time for a few questions? Yep. Okay. Yes. Um, so, part of your um, duty, I guess, is to prepare for these storm events. Are you considering anything about implementing like wetlands to store this water so you don't get as much sediment runoff, or possibly permeable surfaces to change out the blacktop? Or <clears throat> um, okay, so a little outside of my the permeability and road surfaces a little, a little outside. Again, I'm just, just learning about culverts, you know, so. Um, but we have a lot of wetlands. I mean, we're, we're rich, rich in wetlands. If you've hunted or hiked in the Schwambiga Nicolay, <laughs> you're like, yeah, they're good. They have a lot of wetlands. So we're, we're, we're pretty happy with the quality of, our, of the wetlands and the national, that might not be true everywhere, obviously. Wetlands are so, so important for sponging up uh, floodwaters and excess precipitation. Um, and I'm not, not sure about the permeability of road question, so I probably shouldn't talk about that. So, sorry. Yes. In the blowdown areas um, in this last summer, right. you're going to replant that, I'm assuming, but do you go <coughs> and just remove all the blowdown, or do you leave some of it there? How does that work? We are um, salvaging a lot. We will salvage a lot. We will not salvage everything. There's no way. There's no way we could. Um, but there are, there are areas that are le have less damage and or are in uh, where we think there's less risk, for example, of fire or disease, and those won't be salvaged. But we will salvage a lot. And so we have a team of folks right now. They're getting ready to come out with a proposal on that'll sh that'll you know identify which areas will be salvaged and not not all um, or most will need to be replanted. We have really pretty good natural regeneration. Yeah. Yes. My, my question is related to that. After a blowdown, how long do you have to get that, the, the what you do want to salvage, how long do you have to get it out before it's not worth it? Uh, you it's assuming you salvage it. Yeah, yeah. Um, or the, the quality is, is diminished so that it's not I, I, I think they're planning on salvaging a lot of it next summer, so presumably that's still within the period of time when it's you know still acceptable quality. Yeah, yeah. So that would be a year later. So I don't know how much longer. I, I just, I, I'm sorry, I just don't know. Yes. Yeah. In regards to the blowdown area, still, are we looking at like increased fire risk for this coming summer? Like most likely. Yeah, yeah. That's a possibility. And so one of the things we're doing right now is putting in fuel breaks. So some of what we're doing is salvaging timber, but some of it is um, there are specific activities to uh, ensure that there's a break in the fuel. So that might mean going in and taking the timber, but also coming in with uh, a masticator to just really chew up and remove any of the fuel. So uh, our, our fire planners, uh, work really closely with local communities, like so especially some of the lake communities, Crooked Lake, Sunrise Lake, to um, and their firewise communities, which is what we want to encourage, is like lots of community involvement to say, okay, there's a high fire risk here, so this is where we need to emphasize our our fuel reduction. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes. A few years ago, there was a lot of concern about old growth forests, mm -hmm. and I think that translated into less harvest on national forests. Uh, did that occur here in Wisconsin, and is that still the trend? And, and you mentioned pine and, and oak. What about aspen, which needs disturbance? Timber. Yeah, Everybody. right. Or or storms, <laughs> or or wind storms. Yeah. Um, we have a lot of natural areas, and we have protected, um, as I said, about 185,000 acres um, that did not, we were still able to continue a very, our timber harvest at a very high level. So as I said, we're the highest in the, in the nation here. So, um, so yes, we're, we, yes, we, uh, old growth is part of our land management, and yes, aspen harvests are also. You know, it's a million and a half acres, and so, um, there are opportunities for, for all of those things. And our timber harvests are, are just are, are going, even projected to go up next year. So, 
and some of that will be <laughs> because we have this big blowdown and a lot of salvage. But um, whether that's, uh, you know, at a national level, every region is different and every region has their own, you know, set of um, unique circumstances. So I can't really speak to that, but I know in, a, in our area, um, we have a, lo a lot of emphasis on early seral habitat. Uh, we, you'll see proposals like called ESHI, Early Seral Habitat Initiative, or Young Forest Initiative. And so there are definitely places where that is emphasized, um, definitely. And, um, but there are other areas where there's, it's a, kind of at the other end of the land management um, intensity spectrum where that, there's le less, in less timber harvest going on there, so. Yes. Do you have to worry about climate being a taboo word? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, it can be a hot button word, I think, for some people. Um, um, the thing I, again, I always want to emphasize with folks is that it's really the same toolbox. You know, it's not new, uh, it's the same tools. Where it's using timber sales or using, um, uh, underplanting or diversifying forests or right sizing the culverts. I mean, th these are not brand new things. Um, and so I think if people realize it's, we're re relying on the same sort of traditional practices of, um, of um, sustainable forestry and sustainable forest management. That, that's, that's how I, um, that's how I, I try, that's how I understand it and that's what I'd like other people to understand. Yes. What's your view of assisted migration of species northward? I, um, I think we're probably not there yet with some of that, but it's time to start maybe, it'd be great, a good time to do some experimentation. Um, we, um, again, we, uh, I, I mentioned diversity, and I mentioned that a lot of our stands already have oak in them, or they might have a component of, um, a bur oak, or they might have a bitternut hickory component. And so in some cases where we have some of those more uh, future adapted species in the northern forest, and so rather than bringing up, you know, tulip poplar or something else like that, let's, let's work with what we have. Um, but I do know that some people are, are planting bald cypress in an experimental way, so. <laughs> so we'll see, yes. So I'm curious to know about uh, funding mechanisms for the larger size numbers that you put on. Because when we visited some of those communities, some uh, they did not have enough money to uh, put that, that larger size of the culvert. Uh, and the FEMA wouldn't pay for the larger size. They would just uh, jam in the money what used to be the same culvert size. So yeah. uh, many communities ended up kind of just putting a smaller culvert because they did not have enough money to yeah, I, I just know that that was an issue, and I know that that is um, a, a topic of concern, and that is frequently being addressed. And my understanding is that there's some progress there, but that's about as f it's about the, that's the limit of my knowledgeability there. That I know, I I understand that there's there's progress and good conversations, and and I think they're making. Um, some effort to uh, recognize that pay me now or pay me later. You know, like we save millions of dollars uh, by having the appropriate size culvert in place there. So, yeah. I'll just say we have time for about one more question and then we're going to uh, vacate the room. But um, <laughs> it will be available for more questions if you want to hang out in the lobby for a little bit. But we'll to, just take one more question. I solved all the problems. Okay. <laughs> I was curious. I did see a, a documentary on Hayward and how ha they were handling the water flow issue. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, you're a northerner, um, how are the tribes, Bad River, um, Red Cliffs, how are they handling this or did they have serious issues as well? Um, they, I think everybody who lives up north had, had issues. Obviously Highway 2, you know, went through the Bad River Reservation. Um, I know the the Bad River Band, for example, they are very concerned about um, the high proportion of aspen that dominates their um, land base, and so they're really keen to diversify. Um, they've been really very uh, forward thinking. They just developed a tribal uh, adaptation, forest adaptation guide. So they, they're working really closely with our research partners 
to um, to develop in a, in a very to think about climate change in a way that's also very culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate. And um, it's been very again if you that forestadaptation.org you'll see lots of those tribal um, uh, for more, the things that we've developed in partnership with tribes or in, with uh, Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife um, Commission. So really just in this last year especially, some really tremendous and, and um, impressive efforts. So, yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you.